O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forever. The first reading is written in the second book of Samuel, the 15th and 17th chapters. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise to pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged, and throw him into a panic, and all the people who are with him will flee. I will strike down only the king, and I will bring all the people back to you, as a bride comes home to her husband. You seek the life of only one man, and all the people will be at peace. 
and the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Please stand. The second reading is written in the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 18th chapter. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met with his disciples. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there. So Judas, having procured the band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, he drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He answered, I told you that I am he, so if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given to me? O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Deliver me, O oh Lord, my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies. Protect me from those who rise against me. In you, O oh Lord, do I put my trust. Leave me not, O oh Lord, my God. Rescue me from my enemies. my God, for you are the God of my salvation. Rescue me from my enemies, protect me from those who rise
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear friends in Christ. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, someone that you deeply trust betrays you. It doesn't really matter what it is. Your confidence has been broken. Perhaps you told the person something that's very close to your heart that no one else should know, but then they go share it with another. Maybe this person pretends to be a supporter of you and turns out to be just the opposite. I suspect that many of you are actually thinking of someone or some particular situation. We don't have to think in the abstract when it comes to betrayal. We know those that have betrayed us. We know of the situations because the hurt runs deep. And it still even stings a bit. Our theme for today revolves around betrayal. And it's a part of this wider theme of return to the Lord. And of course, betrayal is something that we quite see literally here during Jesus' passion. We think about sins committed when we look at the passion account. My hope is that we will see the ways that our sins also pull us away from God and show our betrayal too. But yet we will still hear God's call to us to return to him because he's the one that offers all forgiveness and reconciliation. In our gospel text, there is betrayal. And it's probably the most notable instance of betrayal in all of the scripture. Jesus betrays, is betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He makes a deal with the chief priests. He brings the temple guard with him. He shows them who the man is and then betrays him into their hands. This self-serving act of Judas, taking money for the life of the Savior, brought guilt and hardship to his heart right at the end of his life. We know this story of betrayal, but we're not going to talk about it quite yet. We'll get back to it in just a minute. But I want to set the stage first with an even older betrayal, one that goes all the way back to King David and that Old Testament reading that you heard this evening. You see, this is the betrayal of David by his own son. His son's name is Absalom. And his trusty advisor, Ahithophel, now this is a story, a true story of betrayal, but it also has, is, a, is a story of how one sin can also beget many other sins. Because before we get to this betrayal and the reason for it, we have to go back yet even further to another betrayal. And this betrayal happened by David himself. He sees that woman Bathsheba that is bathing on the rooftop. And he desires her so much that he hatches a plan to have her for himself. Sends her husband to the front lines to be killed in war. And then finally, the woman who was already with child, his child, would now give birth and be his. But you see, this didn't work out quite the way that he thought. David had a friend a very good friend that called him on his sin. David repents. The baby that is born dies. And a huge rift is now created in all of David's family. That's the part that we don't realize. You see, one of the major impacts of David and Bathsheba's sin is the rift in the family. Absalom, one of David's sons, rebels against his father David. 
He tries to put together a campaign to overthrow his father, to kill him so that he might gain the throne for himself. And one of the people that Absalom, his son, enlists in this plot is Ahithophel. That is, David's trusty advisor, who happened to be, who happened to be Bathsheba's grandfather. What could possibly go wrong? And the story unfolds. Ahithophel outlines this plan to send 12,000 men toward David, who is already very, very weary from war. And he would be able to overtake him and his men and kill him and then put Absalom on the throne. Ah, but David, through the wisdom of the, of the Lord, also finds someone to help him. He plants a spy, a man by the name of Hushai, who actually approaches Absalom with an even bigger and far better plan than Ahithophel. And so Absalom says, hey, I like that plan better. But Hushai warns David of the plan, and David is able to elude Absalom and his men. What happens? Absalom dies. Ahithophel dies. And David returns to the throne. But that betrayal, it haunted David for the rest of his life. In fact, it even came out in one of the Psalms. Psalm 41 is a psalm that David wrote, and it recounts this very betrayal. It says, Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate bread with me, he has lifted his heel against me. David laments the fact that his very trusted and beloved advisor almost certainly would betray him to death. He had turned against him. He takes steps to try to kill him and to place someone else, his own son, on the throne. What a hurtful thing that David must have felt. We understand the pain of betrayal because we've been subjected to it. It's why I asked you at the beginning of the sermon to imagine such a betrayal. Think about it. Someone trusted someone who betrays you. But we don't always consider that our actions of betrayal also are those against our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Ahithophel betrayed David in order to put someone else on the throne. And I want you to know that, yes, you good Christians do exactly the same thing by trying to unseat your Savior and King Jesus. You've denied His Lordship before others. You've ignored God's command and sought to do your thing your way. You've treated others thoughtfully and you've elevated yourself over others, directly contradicting even what the Bible encourages us to do, to count others more significant than ourselves. Paul says that in the Philippians. And the result is what? It's betrayal. The gospel message is very blunt. The good news is blocked. You see, that's what we do. People don't hear or see the amazing love of Christ because we have pushed, pushed Jesus into the background of our lives. We have denied his importance. And God urges us to be bold in our proclamation. He says to us in Matthew chapter 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But that's not what we've done. We have done the opposite, in fact, sometimes. They are betrayal words. Betrayal actions that avoids discipling by avoiding the sharing of the good news. A betrayal that seeks to make Jesus secondary to our own ambitions and desires and sinfully elevate ourselves. Now I know that this is not easy to hear. Because maybe in your mind and in your heart you're better than that. You know, 
it's a little like in the book of Acts when Peter spoke in Solomon's colonnade and called the Israelites to repentance. He said these words, and I bet they're going to ring true in your ears right now. You denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. But then Peter's words of great familiarity and encouragement. Repent, therefore. Turn back that your sins may be blotted out. It echoes of that very invitation that we heard on Good Friday from Joel chapter 2. You remember those, Lord, those words. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents of disaster. Astonishingly, Jesus knew all of this in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he was there, asking, what do you have to do with me? Who do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he, says Jesus. He knew all of this at the very moment of betrayal. He knew who would betray him, yet he stood fast. He knew what was before him. He knew that you would fail, that I would fail, that his disciples would fail. Shall I not drink the cup that my Father has given me? Oh, he shall. But here's what God says. Return to me. I want you to be true to me, says our God. But even when you fail at that, I have already stepped in and provided every blessing that you need. He offers forgiveness. He offers peace. And he offers the strength to turn back and to receive his blessings. When we return to the Lord, we receive all of these things. Through his word, through his precious sacraments, his love gives us so much more than we could ever imagine. His love overwhelms. And so when we hear the word of God or receive the sacrament of Holy Communion together, we are not only in him, but he in us. We are all reconciled to the Lord. May you be encouraged by this gospel message to turn from betrayal and to return to God. May you be blessed. May you be strengthened in all that you do, that it may bring glory to him through you. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense and the lifting up of my hand as the evening sacrifice.
have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. God our Father, you promise to hear our prayers, whether spoken or even too deep for words. During these Lenten days, Breathe the breath of your Spirit into our mouths, that we may learn to pray without ceasing. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Faithful God, through the ancient prophets, you call us to return to you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let these Lenten days be a time when, remembering how you relentlessly return to us in mercy, we return also to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ever-present God, stay with us, for darkness has come, and the day is now past. Forgive, we pray, both our neglect in doing good this day and the wrongs we have done. Awaken us in the morning, bathe in the light of our baptism, so that we may be ready to love and serve you and our neighbor. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God, our strength, the peace you provide through the cross of Christ flows like a river through the chaos of our lives. Lead us to drink deeply from the still waters of your peace and thereby dispel our anxieties and fears so that we may serve you with humility and grace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.